This nugget is focused on the core of Scrum, and that's the sprint. The two to four week repeating, repeating, repeating development cycle. So if there's one aspect to being Scrum, it's running the sprint effectively. And as we've discussed, that's the responsibility of the Scrum Master is to ensure the Scrum best practices are applied in each and every sprint. In this nugget, we're going to focus on everything related to running an effective sprint. We're going to talk about some basic guiding principles of what a sprint is and how a sprint should take place. We'll recap the sprint rituals, the sprint planning, the daily scrum, the sprint review, and the sprint retrospective. We'll look at the sprint artifacts, the sprint backlog, the burn down charts, the burn up charts, as well as the final production software. We'll talk about the various activities that's going to take place in a sprint. We'll talk about how we determine what the length of our sprint is going to be whether it is two to four weeks in length. And finally, we'll talk about some very core aspects to effective sprint management, and that's how to deal with changes that take place in the middle of a sprint. But first, sprint guiding principles. And as you'd expect, because Scrum is lightweight, we actually have a very minimal number of Scrum guiding principles. The key is make it work. The focus on everything we do in a scrum is do the minimum amount of work required to complete the story. I.e. the focus has to be on making it work. Once we have it working, once we have satisfied the story, there may be a subsequent story developed where we want to make it fast. Maybe this is a high transaction system and our original story where we did the minimum amount of work to make the story satisfy. We may want to introduce some efficiency features, some database tuning, some high volume transactional processing software around it to wrap around it. But that typically is a secondary activity once we get it working and I'll stress and maybe we're going to make it pretty and what does pretty mean well that's adding all of the extras and I'm going to call it the gold plating around value adding and within scrum principles making it pretty really isn't a fundamental pretty or fundamental process in scrum because making it pretty is often doing unnecessary future-oriented work. And that's not part of being Scrum. So our guiding principle is make it work. Once it's working, if the business wants it faster, we'll create a new story. And with that second story, we'll make it faster. And only if there's a story, Will we make it pretty? Where pretty is a relative term. Our next key guiding principle of Sprint and Scrum is our focus always has to be on producing working software. Every story should be implementable. Should be ready to run. There's no, oh, I've just done the day, the screen. I don't have any of the processing behind it. Oh, I need to add the edits. Oh, I need to. Oh, I need to. Each and every story, the work we do in our sprint has to be focused on producing working software. Or if the story is not based on working software, our guiding principle has to be that we're delivering direct value for the business through the completion of the story. And our last guiding principle is because Scrum is a self-organizing, self-directing team, it's never our job. The focus always has to be on it's the team's job.
the team is responsible for completing all the stories. And as we've discussed when we've developed our sprint backlog, it may well be that a story is assigned to multiple people. And Fred may do the analysis of the story, and Sally may do the design, and Betty may do the testing, and so on. But it's the team that completes the story. It's never an individual's job, it's always the team job. And with those simple guiding principles behind, we're ready to roll successfully into running and managing a successful sprint in our Scrum delivery world. And in terms of sprint rituals, there are new, new rituals that we have not already discussed. Within a sprint, our sprint is going to be a part of an overall master release plan. So that's actually even a pre-Scrum ritual, is developing the release plan. But again, we're going to run under the assumption that we're going to have multiple sprints that are part of an overall release plan. Our focus is on the individual sprint rituals. And the rituals are very much as we know. Before we start any sprint, we go through the sprint planning process. And part one is where the stories are selected. And part two is where the strategy for completing the sprint is developed. Every sprint must have a sprint planning session, and it must have part one and part two. We then enter into our sprint. So immediately following the sprint planning process, we start the sprint. And I have selected a two-week interval. We'll discuss the, the process for determining the length of our sprint a little later in this nugget. And within the sprint, as we've already discussed, our rituals are we absolutely must have the daily scrums. And we have an entire nugget after this one focused on the activities within the daily scrum. So we're not going to spend much more time and attention on that. But we will do a daily scrum once a day at a consistent time. As soon as the scrum completes, we want to immediately move into our sprint review. There is no prep time. There is no elaborate presentation. We simply say, the last story has been completed. Product owner, come on by. We're ready to do show and tell. And let's get the sprint review completed. We may want to try to stage this that we have a lunchtime break or maybe an end of day break so that there's just a little bit of time, as I said in, in the earlier nugget, to get over the bask and glow of a successful sprint review before we move directly into our sprint retrospective where we do primarily the lessons learned to do the process improvement. And immediately after the sprint retrospective, we start the sprint plan for the next sprint. And all of this happens immediately between each sprint. As I said, maybe with a, a lunch break or an end of day break in between. But there's not prolonged periods of time between the sprint review and the pr sprint retrospective, nor is there a prolonged period of time between the retrospective and the next plan. They all happen immediately adjacent to each other. There is no dead time. And we start the next sprint and we do daily scrums. Then we do a sprint review, a sprint retrospective, a sprint plan, 10 daily scrums, and so on. So nothing new in sprint rituals that we haven't already discussed. Really what I wanted to do here is drive home that the period of time between the sprints has no dead time. We spend our two weeks, we complete our stories, and we immediately start our rituals of the review, the retrospective, immediately launch into the sprint plan for the next sprint, and immediately start. Continuous process. No timeouts. No time to breathe. 
And I deliberately said no time to breathe because I want to spend just a moment talking about that. We do not build recharging time into a sprint process or into a scrum process because there's no need to recharge. And why is there no need to recharge? Because our velocity is based on continuous work at a sustainable pace. And that's the key to the effective velocity is our velocity is 12 story points per sprint and that is a continuous sustainable pace. There is no overtime, there is no slack. This is if everybody puts their heads down and works at a normal work pace on a normal work day and repeats that for 10 work days over our two week sprint, that is our velocity. So it can be a continuous process. There is no need for timeout. There is no time to breathe because there's no need to recharge because it's continuous work at a sustainable pace and people are extremely happy with this. It's predictable, it's repeatable, there is no stress, and there is considerable pride in completing sprint after sprint after sprint and being continuously recharged and ready to move forward to the next sprint. And nor am I bringing any new sprint artifacts in. These are the same artifacts we've already discussed. We have our sprint backlog. Once we're in the sprint, we don't care about the product backlog. That's a planning activity. In the sprint, our team will remain focused on the sprint backlog. The team will refer to the sprint backlog as part of the daily scrum. With the information gathered from the daily scrum, we're going to maintain the burn down chart. And as a result of the work completed on the sprint backlog, the end state will be the 12 stories or the 12 story points worth of working software. And that's it. Again, very straightforward, very easy to understand, and very easy to manage. And stressing what we've already talked about, very easy to manage in a hand fashion. We don't need any elaborate software. Matter of fact, most Scrum advocates suggest you should not use software for the Scrum process, that a cork board, that person-to-person -person communications, that a hand-drawn burn-down chart is actually better for communicating the process in Sprint than any form of elaborate software. The one artifact that I have not specifically called out on this is our sprint vision or goal. And I didn't specifically call it out because that is optional, but highly recommended. The focus of running an effective sprint is right here. The sprint backlog developed in planning our daily scrum to manage our process, our progress against that, our reporting of our progress on the, the burn down chart, and the production of the minimal amount of work to satisfy the minimal requirements on each story, but the focus is on working software. So by now you're probably saying, Steve, why did you create this nugget called a sprint if all you're going to do is tell me about the same rituals and the same artifacts that you've already talked about in previous nuggets because they're the foundation for successful sprint. Now we'll get into some of the more specialized activities that we haven't talked about already in this series to date. And that's first this concept of a team swarm. What is a team swarm? It's multiple members of the team helping focusing on a story.
So the team swarm may be the premeditated process that I've already talked about, where Fred does analysis on story one, and then Mary does design on story one, and then Sally does the development and test on story one. And that can, can be considered to be an organized swarm. Again, with the focus on the team is responsible for completing the story, not the individual. But when we truly talk about a team swarm in a scrum sprint mentality, it's literally the team member who was assigned story number two. So let's say it's Mary. Mary picks up story number two and says, this is that big one we were worried about, isn't it? Who wants to get together for the next two hours and help me work on story number two? So Mary puts her hand up and says, hey, I've got the big story here, guys. We've all been worrying about it. Let's have a team swarm. Who has time? Who has interest? Who has the knowledge, the skills, and the capacity to help me work on story number one? Mary will be ultimately, I'm going to say, responsible to make sure that the swarm happens effectively, but the team will swarm and complete the work that Mary needs help on for story number two. Once Mary says, wow, thanks, that was awesome. I think I'm ready to go with this on my own from now. The team disbands the swarm and either goes back to their regularly scheduled work within the sprint, or by then maybe Fred has picked up story number four and says, you know what? I'm okay on the analysis and design, but when it comes down to my test strategy, I think I'm going to need some help. Anybody interested in getting together at 4 p.m. and doing another mini swarm? So the team is going to move in and move out as needed to help the overall completion of the stories in the various plans that were made for the sprint. So. Keep in mind this concept of a team swarm. Individuals are great, but groups are even better. Use the swarm where appropriate to help your team be more successful. As a scrum master, encourage the team to swarm. You'd be truly impressed with the quality of the results you get from a highly functional team swarming in and out to help other team members work. Other activities, I'm going to say chores. And being a father of many children, I'm often reminded of, oh, we don't want to do our chores. Do I really have to take out the garbage? Do I really have to do the recycling? I cleaned the bathroom last week. It's my brother's turn to clean the bathroom. Chores are typically things no one wants to do. So just like I have chores at home that my children try to pawn off in each other, there's typically going to be some chores in a sprint that no one really wants to do, but we all know must be done. And the big chores, they have to be written up as team stories. So using the principles we've already discussed, where if the team needs a new build server, if the team needs to develop a more efficient search algorithm, those are big chores. Those need to be written up as team stories. But we should be prepared that there's going to be some degree of just day-to-day -day routine activities that must be done. So the team needs to be prepared to do some chores. And I can think of a chore is updating the burn down chart. Doesn't take long, maybe five minutes after each daily scrum, but maybe on a rotational period. Team member number one does the burn down chart today, team member number two does the burn down chart tomorrow, and so on and so on and so on. So just be prepared that the team has to be prepared to do some of these chores, 
and the time to do these chores will become blatantly obvious through the effective velocity. So assuming the team is always prepared to do these chores in each sprint that they work on, the amount of effort, and a lot of authors suggest that the effort is, it's around 20%, it's not an insignificant, it's more than the five minutes a day to update the burn down chart, but if the team routinely and consistently works on their chores, the chore time will be built directly into the velocity, so therefore we never have to worry about having enough time to do our chores because the time is self-fulfilling by the continuous achievement of our velocity. Team grooming. We talked about this already. We talked about the need to constantly be going by the product backlog and looking at it. And we talked about how this is primarily the product owners responsibility. And it is the product owner's main responsibility to do the backlog grooming, but the team should also be prepared to spend some time standing in front of the, the product backlog, maybe with that fresh cup of coffee that they, they just got and saying, you know what, before I sit down and go back to my story, I should just take a quick look through the product backlog and oh, look at that one. I really don't think there's enough detail on that particular story to allow us to proceed and put a little note on it. Take a little yellow sticky and say, product owner, I think more detail is needed on this particular story. It's not the team's responsibility for grooming is to add the details to the story, but it's the team's responsibility to highlight the stories that they believe needs more details so that the product owner, when he or she does their grooming, can highlight on that. Far less time is expected for the team to be available to do grooming, but again, if we do it consistently, it's going to be built into our velocity, and therefore, again, as a scrum master, we simply need to ensure that on a regular basis, the team stops by the product backlog with that fresh cup of coffee, if that's what works for you, and just thinks about, reacts to, and assist the product owner in their grooming process. Depending on your strategy, the team may or may not need to build time for estimating in. In our last nugget on estimating, I suggested we actually have a story for estimating. And if we do in fact have a, a repeating story, a continuous story, if I can use that terminology, to allow for the time for the team to do estimating, probably not in every sprint, but every two or three sprints, we bring out the estimating story. Awesome. And that's my recommended way of dealing with estimating. But a lot of scrums and a lot of sprints don't like to use the specific details for the estimating story, in which case we just, again, need to ensure that there is time built into the overall velocity to allow the team the time to do the estimating to assign the appropriate story points to each story. And finally, and most importantly, the key sprint activity besides writing the working code is the team needs to be prepared to have conversations. The team needs to be prepared to pick up a story, find the product owner, and say, let's have a conversation. Let's take five minutes and have a conversation about what you really meant when you put down, I as type of user need to do something to produce a result. Have a conversation with the product owner to understand what the expectation of the story is. Go back to your desk do a little bit of thinking, do your analysis and design, and then prepare to have another conversation with the product owner. It says, here's what I think I'm going to do. Does this make sense to you? Product owner will say, yeah, you're absolutely on the right path, or no, you need to make some adjustments. Go back, think about a little bit more, develop your test strategy, and then be prepared to have another conversation with the product owner and say, and here's how I think I'm gonna do my testing to satisfy the definition of done. And again, these are all short. These are conversations 
and we deliberately pick the word conversations, these are not meetings. These are not going to your Outlook calendar and formally booking the product owner to meet with you from 3.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. These are casual conversations, which goes back to why we believe the product owner needs to be coexisting, living in the same workspace as the team for at least 50% of their time. So now comes that discussion on what is the proper sprint length. The textbook says, theory says, a sprint should be between one to four weeks with a sprint of two to three weeks being the norm. And for all discussions in this series, I'm picking a two week sprint as my sprint length. Why do I pick two? Because I've personally found that two works very well for me. Is two the right answer? No. The right answer is anywhere between one and four. You need to find the length of a sprint that works best for your product owner, for your team dynamics, and for your own personal way of working. But most scrum masters find that a two to week is the norm. The key to determining your sprint length, it needs to be short enough to be nimble. It needs to be short enough that the likelihood of change being very small. So the longer your sprints get, if you get up to a four week sprint, it is more likely that the business change is going to happen, that there's going to be technology change, there's going to be environmental change, there's going to be legislative change. But the longer the sprint, the more likely that change is going to take place. And obviously the very short sprints, the likelihood of change is extremely very low, which again is why we typically find something in the middle works better. But on the same behalf, we want the sprint long enough to deliver something of value. And that's where a lot of people find that a one week sprint simply doesn't give the team enough time to deliver value. One to two stories of any degree of complexity is often all that you're gonna get out of a single sprint of one week. So again, people will often pick somewhere in the middle that two to three weeks will be the norm. There is no right or wrong answer. The key is pick a length that you believe is going to work for your engagement with your product owner's method of working and stick to it. And the key is stick to it. We want predictability. If you're continuously changing the length of your sprint this week, we want to get two key stories done and be done with it. I'm going to pick a one week sprint next week. We have a, a whole lot of stories we want to do and we're going to pick a four week sprint. That is not scrum. That is not predictable. That doesn't allow your team to get into a rhythm. That doesn't allow your team to develop any degree of consistency with velocity because you can't simply say if I can do three story points in a one week sprint, then I should be able to do six and a two and nine and a three. It's not additive that way. So you absolutely need to pick a length, stick to it, develop the predictability, develop your velocity, and continue to use that sprint length for the duration of your engagement unless it's really wrong. And in our sprint retrospective, we're going to do our lessons learned and our process improvement. So after three or four or five sprints at a selected period, let's say we pick three and the sprint retrospectives consistently say that is not working for us. There's something wrong. We can't get our rhythm. It's too long. There's too much change. There's some reason that a three week sprint is just absolutely not working. And if you've consistently validated that it's not working, then you can change the length of the sprint, but only if your sprint retrospectives are continuously saying your sprint length is inappropriate should you ever change it. And our final discussion in this nugget is what happens when there's changes to sprint. Obviously, we just discussed we want the length to be appropriate to minimize changes. 
So hopefully we have the ideal length of a sprint to minimize the likelihood of changes. But even with that said, reality will come to your project, reality will come to your sprint, and there will be instances where you simply picked too many stories. We thought our velocity was 12. We picked stories that add up to 12, but we only have a day and a half left in our sprint. We're doing our daily scrum and we just say, we're not going to finish. There's going to be two story points of code on completed. What do we do? Do we extend the sprint? Absolutely not. If there's too many stories, you simply work with the product owner and you select the stories to be dropped. So in your sprint, second last sprint or scrum, in your, your sprint, you determine you're not going to make it. You need to remove two story points. You work with the business owner or the product owner rather, and you select the stories to be dropped and they're removed from the sprint. The sprint completes. The story that gets dropped goes back onto the product backlog and presumably will be picked up in the next sprint. But we do not, we do not, we do not extend the sprint by a day to allow those extra two story points to be completed because they, we want to have the predictability. We want to have the predictable velocity. And why did we screw up? Why are we not getting 12 story points worth of code written in this, this sprint? We probably had a bad estimate. We did our estimating game. We had our consensus. Everybody thought that this was a story point of five. But you know what? It really was an eight. Things happen. So we have to be prepared that there will be instances where we work with the product owner and stories will get dropped. Just as likely, there will be instances of sprints where we don't have enough stories. Again, we're two daily scrums away from the end of our sprint. We're looking at our sprint backlog and says, at this rate, we're going to be done this afternoon. So what do we do? We add stories. We work with the product owner. We find the next highest priority stories that fit within our remaining capacity. We add them into the sprint and we continue. So just as likely that we may have to drop the occasional story, it's just as likely that we may have to add the occasional story because our estimating process is not fine science. It's relative scale. So be prepared to add and drop stories working with the product owner. That's part of being nimble, agile, being scrum. But there will be instances, no matter how hard you try, where the length is appropriate to minimize the changes, there will be changes that are non-capacity based. The product owner is going to come to you and say, we need to take this story out of the sprint. We need to add this story into the sprint. This is where I'm going to say as politely as you can, without annoying your product owner, you're going to say, we're four days from the completion of a sprint. The team has its rhythm. The team has its strategy. The team has its plan to complete the sprint in four days. Is it that critical that you absolutely must change the stories in the sprint? or can it wait four days and we'll absolutely complete that new story in the next sprint? And hopefully the product owner will say, yeah, you're right. It's really, really important, but I understand the consistency and the velocity and the predictability. Yeah, I can afford to wait and, and do that story in four days time. So where possible, try to negotiate the change out of the sprint and get it completed. But there's also going to be instances where the product owner comes running down and said, stop the presses. Story number 15 is no longer required. The government has just changed its legislative mandate and everything in that story is no longer a legislative requirement. It would be an absolute waste of our organizational resources to complete that story. Then 
<laughs> Why would we want to waste organizational resources? Yeah, we will take the, the story out of the sprint. So yes, there will be instances where we're going to negotiate with the product owner to add or remove stories, but we want to minimize. We want to stick with our plan as much as possible. So again, as I said, without annoying your product owner as politely as you can say, can we just finish it? We have our momentum, we have our predictability, we have our strategy, we have our plan. Let us get it done. At worst case, it's 10 days away, but in most cases, you're only going to get this degree of change probably halfway through. So, you know, on average, it's five days away and it may be only a day away. So minimize where possible, but accept the fact that it may happen. And finally, canceling a sprint. Again, maybe the product owner said everything we're working on in the sprint is now lo no longer required because the government legislation has changed. Then cancel the sprint. But again, where possible, same strategy applies. Minimize it. The team has velocity. It may not be that important. Your, your priorities may have changed, but the, the ramp up and ramp down time for canceling a sprint probably would be more significant than the effort spent completing the sprint. So again, unless it's absolutely totally wasted time, as politely as you can without annoying your product owner, negotiate to try to keep from canceling a sprint but be prepared and, and let it be canceled when necessary. And that concludes this nugget on what is a sprint. We talked about the guiding principles. Make it work. Do the minimum required to get the job done and then move on. Act as a team. Be agile, be nimble. We reviewed the scrum rituals and we discussed the interaction of the, the rituals, the plan to the sprint with daily scrums, to the review, to the retrospective, right back to the plan with no time in between because we have a velocity which allows us for continuous work at a sustainable pace. We reviewed the very minimal scrum artifacts, the sprint backlog, our burn down chart, and our working software. All oriented to being nimble and responsive. We talked about the various activities with the key one I would like to bring forth is the team swarm, work as a collective to get the job done. And finally, we discussed the sprint, sprint length. Pick a time, Steve likes two weeks, and stick to it. And then we finally discussed what happens when the plan for a sprint doesn't work out, that we're gonna add stories, when we have more time than stories, we're going to remove stories. When we have more stories than we have time, and that's routine. Expect to do that. And we also discussed when the product owner wants to make changes to the stories or wants to outright cancel a sprint. And our answer to that is minimize the occurrences where we actually change the stories in a scrum or a sprint rather, or outright cancel a sprint because our sprint is short. We have our momentum and we want to finish. But we don't want to blatantly waste our organizational resources. So if there's absolutely valid reasons why we need to change or cancel a sprint, we'll do it. But we will try to minimize the occurrences of that. And that is the essence of a sprint. This concludes our nugget on a sprint. I hope this module has been informative for you. And thank you very much for viewing.